chapter number 2. Aren't we thankful for the Heritage Conference? Everything that's involved in Heritage Conference has been throughout the years superb, way above average. I'm very, very grateful that the church that I'm privileged to be part of and to be their pastor wants to come. This is probably the most looked forward to meeting that they attend and they spend most of the year raising funds and trying to make plans and get vacation time to be here. Young people that meet and get married, uh, start families, they're here tonight because they are so happy with the things that God has done for them at the Heritage Conference. This venue is a little bit too small. I have no idea what from here, but I do know this, that the hand of God has been on this meeting every step of the way and we're very grateful for what the Lord has done. And hitherto hath the Lord helped us. And he will continue to do so. Thank you, Bishop and Sister Johnson, Pastor and Sister Burgess, First Pentecostal Church, Colorado Springs, for your vision, for your passion, for your spiritual direction, and especially for your hospitality. And then thanks unto our great God who hath given us this meeting. And help so many of our young people. Amen. He has sanctioned this meeting and come near to help us. We're very grateful for it. I'm very thankful that the bride, my bride of 42 years is with us tonight. I love her very much. And as we grow older together, I find out that our love is deeper and richer. And I'm enjoying spending more time with her if I could just convince her that our time together is fun, it would be really great. But I'm glad that she's here. And I borrowed this from my friend, Brother Ray Brown, who's also in attendance tonight. He says this often, but I think he borrowed it from a higher power and plagiarized it. But our beloved son, in whom we are well pleased, is also here tonight. Elder Dudley said he was going to keep him. Made me nervous. So I offered to swap Brother Jonathan Dudley straight across. And then I got very nervous, and Elder Dudley said, no problem. <laughs> a words that effect. And, uh, but anyway, so grateful that he is here. The wonderful, wonderful saints from home, a lot of great friends, and the apostolic brethren. I feel the least among all of these great men, but tonight, I'd like for the Lord to come. I'd like for him to help us. I'd like for him to challenge us. I'd like for the Lord to change us in this conference tonight. Amen. I don't want us to have to wait to get this thing off the ground, and I don't think that we will in the spirit. It takes a lifetime of preaching and teaching to save us and to keep us saved. But there are special times when hopes and dreams and desires all come together at the confluence of divine intervention. And there are powerful, life-changing experiences that are found. Anointing is bestowed, and it's only by the anointing that the yoke shall be destroyed. In one conference... A man's life could be affected. A lady's life could be affected so that they are never the same. And everybody will walk in awe of the change that God has wrought in their life. In one service, the culmination of a lot of preaching and a lot of desires could finally congeal together in one special moment. And somewhere in a tear-stained, soaked carpet moment, Somewhere in a corner with God, this could be the service that changes your life forever. This could be the conference that makes you the man, the woman you've always desired to be. I'm reading tonight from the book of Acts chapter number 2, verse number 46 and also verse number 47. And they continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of a heart, praising God 
having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. I'd like for you to note these words from verse number 46 and singleness of heart. Would you say that with me? And singleness of heart. And the words in verse number 47 seem to follow hard on the heels of that statement. And the Lord added to the church. There's an ingredient that we need for true apostolic revival. A real visitation of the Holy Ghost. I don't know. I really don't know. I'm trying my best tonight to lead the eyes out of all that I have to say to this wonderful and powerful congregation. But I am searching. Something's been pressed deep into my spirit lately, and I cannot get away from it. It brings me to tears easily in prayer. It moves me in the service. We started something recently at the home church that we call M and M's wonderful lady in the congregation made beautiful banners. They're beautiful blue or, uh, and gold, and, and uh, I've got it all messed up here, but, but uh, beautiful fringe and beautiful what letters on there. Reserved for M&Ms only. And the first two pews in the center section are for those men, those young men. They do not yet feel the call, but they want it. And so we called them maybe ministers. Somewhere we've got to start this journey of reaching, building, establishing an apostolic hunger and an apostolic desire. Somewhere in us has got to come a transmission of the passion and the deep drive that's in us and put it into the hearts of men who are going to walk tall in dark days, bringing the light of the glorious gospel. And tonight, it's very possible that the next name that will breathe, be breathed upon the lips of congregations for years to come is a young person sitting on these chairs, reaching for God with all of their heart. And it could be that the greatest single revival we've ever heard of since the day of the Azusa Revival since the times of the apostolic outpouring in Acts in Jerusalem, it could be that that revival starts in this Heritage Conference, the year 2018. Would you pray to that end with me right now with a loud voice? Heavenly Father, we love you. Pray earnestly. Trust me, it's going to count tonight. The earnestness is going to count tonight. Trust me on that. Glory to God. Somebody lift up your voice very high to the Holy Ghost. Somebody lift up your heart very high to the Holy Ghost. I love you, Jesus. You may be seated. Dr. Daniel Simons began to study something that baffles my mind some time ago. And he proved a theory and the study that he proved, proved a a phrase, and I'm trying to find a way to say it correctly, but it's called sustained inattentional blindness. Sustained inattentional blindness. One of the experiments that he made was that he took two teams of three people and he gave one team black shirts, the other team white shirts. Each of them were giving a ball, and uh, that ball was to be passed 
among the members of each team. They were stationed in front of elevators in a very small area, and they were each moving and tossing the ball back and forth. And when it was completed, the subjects that were going to view this in the study were brought into a room, and each of them were asked to view the film of these teams, passing the ball back and forth among them. They were asked specifically to count the number of times that the team in white shirts passed the ball. The answer was almost unanimous. In this short study, short film, the white team passed the ball among themselves 15 times. Everybody was grateful and thankful that they had passed the test. And then they were asked the question, did you see the gorilla? More than half, almost two-thirds, answered, what gorilla? They were then asked to review the film again and to see if they could see the gorilla. Sure enough, about halfway through the filming of this experiment, a man dressed in a, dr- a gorilla suit appears in the middle of this filming area. He is not hiding. He is not trying to be obscure, but he's in the very center. He stands there prancing and following the mimicry of gorillas everywhere, begins to beat upon his chest. And then after a few moments of time, lengthy time, he goes back out of the film. At no time did he move in front of the ball that was being tossed. It's too lengthy and probably too deep for my simple mind to try to explain to you in detail what I heard and what I read concerning this. But suffice it to say that our eyes created by God to see They were created to see what we aim at. That is why a man can become a marksman with an instrument, a gun in his hands. David could take that sling and he could drop a giant and fall. he would fall dead. And so to the exclusion of almost everything else within our view, when we have aimed, our eyes at something, everything else fades into the periphery. It is called specific focus direction. And thus the maximum was, the maxim was born, what we aim at is what we see. I want you to think about that for a moment. What we aim at is what we see. The thing that becomes our focus, the thing that becomes our desire, the thing that begins to fill our conscious thought and we view it with intense interest, that is what we see. I believe there are some throughout the scripture that have been possessed by this spirit of sustained inattentional blindness or specific focus direction. We find the writings in Job chapter 23 and verse 13. He said of the Lord, he said that he is of one mind and who can turn him. And what his soul desireth, even that he doeth. Daniel had this attitude In Daniel chapter 1 and verse 8, it says, But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the king's meat or the portion, amen, and the wine that was offered. But he purposed in his heart. The apostle Paul had that. In 20th chapter of Acts, in verse number 24 in part, he says these words, on his way to Rome, but none of these things move me. 
neither count I my life dear unto myself. He see, would say in Philippians 3 and 13, very familiar words, brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do. It seemed to be the hallmark of the original church, and they continuing daily with one accord in the temple, breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. Singleness of heart. This is the only time in your Bible that this word is used, and it's only in the New Testament. It is derived from a Greek word that begins with the preface ah, which means not. And then the word that follows means stony ground. And so what it is implying is that it's not complicated. It's not difficult. It's not hard. As a matter of fact, hence it means something simple or plain. And I have penciled in to Vincent's word studies these words. It's not very complicated. And the Bible said with singleness of heart. Webster says of singleness is state of being one only or separate from all others. The opposite of doubleness, complication, or multiplicity. Simplicity, sincerity. It means purity of mind or purpose. Freedom from duplicity as singleness of belief, singleness of heart. I have known some men here and there in my lifetime that were driven by the concept of singleness of heart. I don't have time to chase it tonight, but I would really like to. But the venue will present itself, I'm certain, in the future, and then I will follow it. But great men with single purpose and single determination and a single goal, and a single heart after God have profoundly affected the apostolic church in my lifetime. I think about my beloved pastor. He went to a city with a godly promise, but that church that he went to was in sad, terrible disrepair and in horrible decline. Not a place that we probably would fellowship, but he was led by God, and he went there. When he stepped up on the porch to approach the front door of that church where there was nobody but himself, the front door of its own accord swung open, and the Lord spoke to him in a voice that he heard and could understand, Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. A man with a single purpose, by the name of Elder Westberg, went to the city of Junction City. It was a low-life community attached to a military base, but Faith Tabernacle cleaned up that community, and revival broke out. And instead of being a low-life town where it was trouble and sorrow, there's a mighty monument to a man's faith. And tonight, pastored by a great man of God and a church in revival, amen, is because a man, a man, a man had this spirit of singleness of heart. This host church right here, I called the bishop to make sure that I was correct. But Frank Bartleman wrote, Six times the Spirit, I, I spoke, and the Spirit flowed like oil. All the possibilities were purity and unity prevail. Three times by three separate voices and distinct persons without any Co uh, uh, connection together except by knowledge of friendship began to speak these words I will 
pour out my spirit like a river. It was not an empty promise to a faithless man, but it was a man with a singleness in his mind, a singleness in his heart, a singleness in his spirit to do the work of the Lord. There are great men here tonight, great pastors, great preachers, great evangelists, men that I'm proud to rub shoulders with and very humble just to stand in their presence. They've gathered here tonight like the gathering of eagles, not to hear the voice of the speaker, but to lend something to the burden and the heartbeat of the almighty God. God, you did it before, do it again. You've touched in the past, touch again. Praise God. In the word of God, a man that's captured my attention by the name of Jacob seems to be a man that was single in his pursuit of the things of God. As a matter of fact, if I were to uh, try to single out one individual that seemed to have a stubborn tenacity about the promises of God, it would probably be this man by the name of Jacob. He is the kind that said, my fathers received from God, and I will have that or die. I will not live an empty life. I will not fall in the shadow of the promises of God. I will not work in a church in decline. I will have a visitation of the Lord for myself. Genesis 25 and 26 tells us of his birth and when he was born and his hand took hold on Esau's heel and his name was called Jacob. Something was foretold. This is a portent of things to come. He has a hold of the hand of this brother who exited into the world first. In Genesis 25 and 31, we see this man over a small fire in which the pungent smoke and the aromatic aroma, a man of a bowl or a pot of, of lentils, a, a, a mess of pottage is, is being cooked. And we see him looking up into the hungry eyes of his brother Esau. And he says, sell me this thy birthright. I want it. I'm going to have it. And Jacob said in Genesis 27, 19, to his father, clothed in his brother's garments, got sheepskin on his hands and around his neck, and he's He's coming in to a father that cannot rightfully discern. And he said, I am Esau, that thy soul may bless me. And in verse 35 of the same text, the Bible tells us that Jacob makes this pronouncement to Esau. Pardon me. Uh, is Isaac makes this pronouncement to Esau, thy brother came what's with subtility and hath taken away thy blessings hath taken away thy blessing in Genesis chapter 29 and 18 when he has served seven years he says these words or he makes an agreement I will serve thee seven years for Rachel and in verse number 30 he loved also Rachel more than Leah and served yet another seven years, seven more years. In Genesis 30 and 37, when it's coming time to inherit those that, that Laban doesn't want out of the flocks and out of the herds, he takes him rods of green poplar and of the hazel and chestnut tree, and he pilled white strakes in them, and made the white appear which was in the rods. He set the rods which he had put 
pull or piled or pilled before the flocks in the gutters in the watering troughs. When the flocks came to drink, that they should conceive when they came to drink. And the flocks conceived before the rods and brought forth cattle, ring straight, speckled, and spotted. And Jacob did separate the lambs and set the faces of the flock toward the ring straight and all the brown in the flock of Laban. And he put his own flocks by themselves and put them not unto Laban's cattle. And it came to pass whom whensoever the stronger cattle did conceive that Jacob laid the rods before the eyes of the cattle in the gutters that they might conceive among the rods. But when the cattle were feeble, he put them not in. So the feebler were Laban's and the stronger Jacob's. And in the 31st chapter of Genesis in verse 20, and Jacob stole away unawares to Laban. This is the man that's got a single desire. Something touched my grandfather Abraham. Something was passed to my father Isaac. Something that they possessed, I've got to possess it. And I've got to have it. I must not live without it. I'm going to have it. And it seemed like everything that this man did had one goal and one possibility. And that was the blessing and the favor of the almighty God upon his life. Praise God. He's almost there. And he's almost to inherit. And he's almost to get the thing that he wants to get. On his way out of the land, it's already been mentioned by Pastor Burgess tonight that he builds himself a place of rest and he comes to himself from a dream from the Lord and he makes himself a pillar in that place and he says, I will return someday and I'm going to bless God and I'm going to give to God my life. And a tenth of all that I ever gain is going to be the Lord's. And God visited him there with that desire and gave him the promise of Abraham and Isaac. And he said, I am with thee and will keep thee and will bring thee again into this land. And I will not leave thee. And so he's on his way, leaving Laban, makes an agreement with Laban. They set up a marker. I won't go past this and you don't come this far. And they're not going to be enemies. And so he makes his way. And if you read the very next chapter and verse number one, you read, and Jacob went on his way and the angels of God met him. I've been thinking about that a lot. As a matter of fact, when I was reading that, I... Tears squirted out of my eyes. I absolutely had to put my Bible down on the desk and begin to weep before God. What kind of man do angels just show up to welcome him back into the promised land? What kind of man do angels start ministering to him uninvited, unasked, uncalled for but he just shows up and as he's walking along he recognizes this is God and these are the angels of the almighty my 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 I've been pondering that with all of his crooked dealings with all of the things that he has failed in with all of the things it looks like he has done cheating and striving against his brother and trying to attain something that by birth did not belong to him. The birthright was his brother's. It was not just a simple little, I was born first, neener, 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 but it had some weight 
to it. It meant something. I was born first, and so I'm going to receive something that nobody else will ever be able to receive. And Jacob just couldn't live with that idea. But there was something in him driving him, driving him. And it evidently got the attention of the Almighty God. And it evidently moved something in the heart of God. Yes, it did. I'm not advocating tonight being crooked. I'm not advocating tonight being dishonest. I'm not advocating striving. But I am advocating going after it with your whole heart and your whole spirit. And then Jacob hears that Esau and his 400 armed men with vengeance forsworn are on their way to meet him. And thus begins a very poignant, powerful, and lonely event in the word of God and Jacob was left alone and the wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day and when he saw that he prevailed not against him he touched the hollow of his thigh and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him and he said let me go for the day break it and he said I will not let thee go except thou bless me and he said unto him what is thy name Then he said, or and he said, Jacob. And he said, thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. Hear this. For as a prince, as a prince hast thou power with God. Power with God. All of that searching, all of that single desire, all of that hunger, all of that design in his life to have the promises of God. All of it met that moment. Thou hast power with God and with men and hast prevailed. I don't know. I don't know how to say it like like I really, really feel it in my heart. But there's just a certain aura upon some men that you meet. There's just a certain feeling in some assemblies when you go there. There's a feeling that you you can't identify it, but you know it's different, and you know it's powerful. It makes the hair stand up on the back of your neck. It, It makes something inside of you go real still and real cold and real quiet. And you're walking in something that you can't hardly, you can't hardly feel anything else but that, and you don't know how to describe it, but you just know that it's there. I call that the favor of God. It's, it's, it's a little bit more than just the anointing upon a man to preach. I don't know if it'll come tonight, but I've asked God to do it. I really have asked him to do it. I'm not interested tonight in just, in just the anointing upon me to deliver this. If I make a mess out of it, that's on me. It's not God. But that's not what I'm after tonight. I want something to go from corner to corner of this room. I want something to go from every chair to every man, to every woman, to every young lady, to every child in the house, to all of our guests. I want it to flow out the door and go out into that lobby area. The Shekinah, the anointing, the favor, the deep calling to deep. Such an impact, such a mark was imprinted from this meeting. Such a mark on this man that generations thereafter were affected by this man. For the Bible tells us in verse 32, Therefore the children of Israel eat not of the sinew which shrank, which is upon the hollow of the thigh unto this day, because he touched the hollow of Jacob's thigh, in the sinew that it shrank, that shrank. My God have mercy. Such an impact, 
they're still talking about it. Such an impact, they still won't eat it. It's passed now just from word of mouth to, hey, we don't eat that. Why don't we eat it? We just don't eat that. That's something that's in us. That's something we got from somewhere way back, but we don't eat that. And and you'd have to go back a few generations to find out that it was the mark of a man. There's, There's certain marks that come upon this fellowship. And the fellowship of apostolic men. And and you get around them and, and, and you puzzle over it for a little while. And it's not long before you pick up, you pick up what that mark is. You pick up where it came from. You pick up kind of how it operates. And you say, ah, I recognize that. That goes back to brother so and so or that operates like brother so and so. And, uh, and there's nothing wrong with all of that. But, but there's just something about it, something about it. We still talk about Brother Verbal Bean. We still marvel at the experiences that we heard, the things that we felt, the power that we walked with him, the word that he preached, the understanding, the simplicity of his desire and his hunger. He was not everybody's good boy, Charlie, in the revival services, but he was a man given to prayer. He would come in and he would say to the pastor, I will tell you when I'm going to eat. Until then, I will not be eating. Please don't ask me to. And it may be a week and it might be a few weeks and it might be a few days, but he would shut himself in day after day. One day I heard the story of a man that told they were concerned and they heard him moaning all night. They'd heard him moaning all day. They'd heard him moaning way up into the afternoon. Now the second day and concerned, they tiptoed to the door. And when they cracked the door and looked in, there was that that elder laying on the floor in a pool of his own perspiration. And he had darkened the floor where he was laying because he had been in agonizing travail before God. But when he walked, angels showed up. And where he went, there was a visitation of the Lord. I want to tell you something about this man, Jacob. This man, Jacob, received promises and blessings from his father and from his father's father. And he respected that his entire life. He didn't try to cut corners, as it were, with God. But he respected that. Esau was careless about his birthright. He went out of his way to provoke and to agitate and to disagree with his father. You read it. You read it. Went out of his way to do it. He had his own opinions about things, but not Jacob. Not Jacob. Jacob's going to get something. Jacob's going to receive something. Jacob's going to inherit something. And he said, whatever it was my daddy's got and whatever it was my grandfather had, I want it too. I've got to have it. Is this making any sense tonight? Oh, God, help me somehow. Somehow help me. Jacob pursued. Jacob aimed for. Jacob shot at. Jacob purposed in his heart. Jacob targeted the blessings of God. His intent was day and night. I will serve the God of my fathers. Their relationship with God, their encounters with God are going to be my own. I'm going to have a relationship. I'm going to have an encounter. I'm going to walk with God. My God, have mercy. May I pause long enough to say, hey, Heritage Conference, what's wrong with the old paths? What's wrong with old time apostolic Holy Ghost anointing? What's wrong with prayer meetings at last? What's wrong with living right, living godly, living holy? What's wrong with keeping the stand of our elders against Hollywood? 
YouTube. I don't want to digress. I really don't. But he served. He wanted to serve the God of his fathers. He wanted their belief system. Whatever it was they believed, he believed it too. It was deep in his heart. You put him side by side. No wonder that the scriptures record Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Stand them up side by side. They've got the same peculiar walk with God. They've got the same peculiar belief system. They've got the same honor. They've got the same reverence. They've got the same earnestness in their spirit. Yes, they did. And it burned in them. And it moved in them. I'm at the age where I think about it a lot. I think about it a lot. Whose hands is the apostolic church going to fall into? I read something that bothered me a lot. Baby boomers. Those are people that were born between 1946 and 1964. If you're a preacher or a pastor here tonight, you were born between those years, 1946 and 1964. Would you stand, please? My, fewer than I would thought. You may be seated. Baby boomers are retiring at the rate of 10,000 per day. This is according to Pew Research and the Social Security Administration. This is a direct quote. As more baby boomers retire, there are fewer replacement workers to take over. This is causing what has been referred to as a huge knowledge gap. A huge knowledge gap. Something is not bridging. Something's not crossing over. Something is not being transmitted. I stand here tonight and I tell you the truth. I accept the challenge. I accept the responsibility. I don't know how many years left that I have, but I accept the challenge. I accept the responsibility. That's why M&Ms were born. That's why when we can do it on Friday night, there's about 14 young men, grown men, that we meet for ministers training. I'm trying to do something. I'm trying to put something in the heart of somebody. God's got to help us. I'm on a recruitment drive tonight. This is what I have been feeling for months and months and months and months. I'm on a recruitment drive tonight. I don't have the big bass drum, but I wish that I did. I would beat it. I would beat it. I would beat it. And I would cry out, gather around, gather around, gather around. I would beat it. If I had a tambourine, I'd shake it. And I would cry out, come, come and listen, gather around. And I would cry out, there's a need, there's a need, there's a battle raging. Soldiers are needed. Men are needed. Women are needed. Gather round, gather round. Who'll sign up? Who'll say I will? Who will sign the dotted line? Who will say I want it? Who will say it's important to me? Who will say I've got to have it? Who will say I've got a single determination? Somehow I feel it so so heavy on my soul and so heavy on my spirit that God wants to visit this conference. He wants to visit this conference. Now I'm not talking about just giving somebody another shot at the limelight. You may be seated. Amen. I'm tired of folks winning awards because of their methods of trying to find somebody else's saints and bring them together and, and, and say we got a church going on. I'm tired of that. I'm tired of that. 
I'm tired of that. I'm tired of driving down the streets and seeing thousands, multiplied thousands of souls that are on their way to hell and entire places in our city where there's no church and no witness and no opportunity. I'm tired of going by the churches that Micaiah had to fight with that were all compromised and all blessing and all prophesying only good things upon your life. Is there not a prophet left in Israel? Is there not somebody left that will look out and say there's got to be a revival? There's something raw and visceral and urgent that's burning in my spirit. Amen. It's burning on the elders because I've reached the age that I have without dying, thank God. And because I've still got a little strength and a little bit of cognizance left, there's something in me, there's something in me that I feel it. And I don't get around elders very long before our conversation begins to shift to it. And that is a dearth of real apostolic churches, of real apostolic preachers that somehow the favor and the blessing and the anointing of God is upon them that when folks walk through the door, the supernatural is there to meet them. Don't you jump up yet, get all excited because that does not come just because somebody pushes the right jump button and says we're going to have it but somebody toils in the night and somebody dreams about it all day and somebody spends some lonely rough hard hours alone saying dear God I don't care if my pillow's waiting at home there's something bigger on my heart I don't care if my hips are hurting there's something bigger in my spirit I don't care if my back is sore from this heart ground. There's something burning in me. Won't you give us a revival? Won't you give us a visitation? I want it. I want it. I want it. I want it, I want it, I want it. You look at me, I want it, 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 I want it. The other morning, in the early hours of the morning, I won't even tell you what the hour was, but in those early hours of the morning, I walked out of my study and I walked over to to the fence, that's the security fence, and I ran the combination in that, that lock and turned the tumblers and, and I opened it up the lock and the chain dropped and I picked up that piece of chain link and moved it enough to go through. And then I walked around on dark, dusty ground and I walked around with tears streaming down my cheeks and I walked around talking to God and I walked around a building in progress and I said, God, right here has got to be holy ground. Right here, you've got to kiss this place. You've got to. If you don't, I don't want to be here. I don't want to pastor anymore. If you're not coming, I'm leaving because I'm going to find where you are. I'm not staying here, God, if you don't kiss this place. If you don't do it, I'm a Jacob in my spirit. I'm not an Esau. Just, just shout me down. Just give me a little, a little frill. That, that's all I need. A little filigree on the side. That's all I need. No, I want something deep. I want something moving. I want something passionate. I want something powerful. I wish they were here tonight. They are not here. But Jonathan, come quick, son. Run up here. And Melissa, run up here real quick. Just come on, Melissa, quick. If you're here tonight, I think you're here. Wherever you are, Melissa, I can't, I can't see you. Where's your sister at, son? Hey, she, you believe she's coming? Okay, she missed it. But, but we went to a certain restaurant uh, night after night. 
became Sister Garrett's favorite restaurant. And the man behind the counter was rude to us and rough to us. And, and I don't know how many times that I was going to report him because I had a personal relationship with the owners. And every time that, that my belly was about full of his snide remarks and his attitude, when we'd walk through the door, he'd say, ee, ee. And, and, and it's them again, ee he would say and then he'd act like we were the worst thing that happened and we couldn't tip enough and we couldn't be kind enough and we couldn't ignore enough for him to come our way and just to be nice to us but there was a Saturday night after prayer when I walked into that restaurant Jonathan was not yet born his sister was very very small and 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 he came from behind the counter after I paid our bill and I was walking away he had my back and he called me and he said have you just a moment? And when I turned around, tears were falling down his face. And he said, what do you have? What do you have? What is it that you have? What does your wife have? What do your daughters have? What is that? What is that? Whatever that is, I want it. 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 Thank you, John. And John's got, got a beautiful experience with God. And he's got a hunger for God. And he's one of the M&Ms. And I'm going to embarrass you, Shelby. I want to ask you to stand up. But Shelby's standing or sitting right over here on, uh, in the front of this building. And it was just about two Sunday nights ago ago her life was so messed up and she walked through the doors and immediately the spirit of God arrested her we baptized her Sunday night and a week ago she received the baptism of the Holy Ghost and she's here at Heritage tonight full of desire for God that's her with her hands lifted up she don't look like she used to look God got a hold of her. I'm telling you, there's a revival out there. But somebody's got to get a Jacob spirit. Somebody's got to get a Jacob attitude. I'm telling you that one of the things I feel like is lacking, lacking among us, lacking among us is a passionate, driving desire. A passionate driving desire. I don't care what kind of suit you're wearing. You hear me? I don't care. I don't care what kind of shoes you have on. You listen to me. I don't care. I don't care what kind of home you have. It doesn't matter to me. I don't care how much money you can flash. I don't care about that. But I'll tell you one thing I'm scanning this crowd looking for. I'm looking for a Jacob. I'm looking for a heel grabber. I'm looking for somebody that at the right moment Come on. I'm looking for somebody at the right moment with a bowl of beans uh, stirring on a fire uh, can look into the hungry eyes uh, of somebody that's got it uh, and can say, I'll trade you for it. Uh, I want this. Uh, I've got to have it. Uh, I'm tired of hearing a, a Pentecostals of privilege. Uh, I want to hear a Pentecostals of prayer. I'm tired of hearing a preacher's children uh, with a, with a, with a with the spoon in their mouth, born uh, with that sp golden spoon in their mouth. Uh, I want to hear uh, a raw desire for a visitation of the Holy Ghost. Uh, I want to hear of somebody that grovels on the floor and crawls on their knees uh, and said, God, if you built a church in Colorado Springs by giving Bishop Johnson a promise, God, give me a promise. Be seated a moment longer. I'm almost through. I wish Elder Howard felt better. I'd, I'd ask him to come stand by my side, but Elder, you don't have to. And I'm going to tell you something. That man and this wonderful man of God right here, the three of us have been close friends for a long time. And we have seen great things in God and experienced it. And something in us is so dissatisfied because we're hearing about a lot of ministries 
but we're not hearing about too many Jacob ministries of getting alone and getting a hold of and finding the visitation of the Lord in their life. Have you ever gotten on your hands and knees and put your nose in the carpet and start crawling and crying and snotting and bellering because words won't work because the drive in you is so big. We are fighting a sensual generation that wants to know how good they look. They wants to know that every eye is on them that wants to know that they can attract the attention of any man they want. A little girl looked at me in the aisle of the church one night, 16 years of age, and she said to me, I can have any man in this church any time I want him. And I said, oh, no, you can't. And that life is a wreck tonight but the church is moving on and we're facing that spirit in this conference, in our ranks. It's among us. I prayed against it today. I talked to God about it today. I'm sick of it. I'm sick of that self-serving spirit of what's in it for me and how does it bless me and how does it help me and how does it make me better. My God, have mercy. Doesn't anybody have a Jacob spirit tonight that said, God, whatever that birthright has in it, I've got to have it. I've got to have it. I've got to have it. I can't live another night. Some of you came here not for the purpose of meeting God but you came here for the purpose of meeting a mate but you don't have the right spirit that's going to attract the young men and the young ladies at this conference and if they're attracted to your spirit they've got the wrong spirit but there's some other young men and young women in this house that got a desire for God and let me tell you something God will bring the right person to you at the right time and you'll be exceeding happy when he does But we've got to get rid of that self-serving spirit. We've got to get rid of that sensual spirit. We've got to get rid of that selfish spirit. I'm convinced the reason that God does not bless more is because he cannot trust us with it. are so skewed. I'm quitting. Musicians come. My God have mercy. My God have mercy. Hold on a minute. When are we ever going to get the concept? That Heritage Conference is not just another conference. That it's not just another meeting. If you just came for a conference, God bless you. Please dismiss yourself in a hurry. God wants to visit here. And the Esau spirit's not going to get a blessing. And you may hinder a blessing. But I am convinced that God is interested. And God is very concerned tonight. And I cannot get it out of my spirit. And I can't get it out of my heart. Singleness of 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 heart. There's a problem over here. I got singleness of heart. There's an issue over here. Singleness of heart. Singleness of heart. Singleness of heart. Singleness of heart. It's got to be the doctrine. It's got to be holiness. It's got to be truth. It's got to be righteous. It's got to be holy. It's got to be clean. It's got to be blessed of God. 
Singleness of heart is my mantra. Singleness of heart is my desire. Singleness of heart is my prayer. Singleness of heart is the way I sing. Singleness of heart is the way I seek. Singleness of heart is the way I come to church. Singleness of heart is the way I work my job. My job's only there to keep me in clothing and to keep a roof over my head. But it's singleness of heart. It's singleness of heart. It's not vacation, paydays, quitting times. That's not what I'm about. We would have more visitation of the Spirit. We would have more holiness prevailing. We would have more condemnation of carnality by the absolute purity of God till men and women throughout the building would scream and cry and jewelry would come flying off. Amen. And ungodly attitudes and ungodly spirits would melt and begging for God's forgiveness they'd be forced to leave as the blood came sweeping back in again but we got too many issues to contend with and we're too diverted at, and we're too divided at singleness of heart 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 brother Garrett you should not do it that way that's all right I'm going to do it anyway it's worked before it's going to keep on working brother Garrett you're, you're old fogey you're out of touch nobody does that anymore that's all right singleness of heart singleness of heart singleness of heart and when you show up you can feel the difference and when you get around it you can feel the difference singleness of heart singleness of heart that's the drum beat of my spirit singleness of heart singleness of heart simplicity one thing have I desired of God and I'm gonna have it simplicity I want God I want his visitation. I want his promise. I've got to have it. Don't you dare come because the crowd's coming. Separate the wheat from the chaff. I've been in the ministry a long time. Pastored the same church 37 years. I feel like Ned and Knee Bridges. I feel like I'm in the first reader. Singleness of heart. Pick up chairs. Pick up chairs. We need more room. Let's just come quickly. Some of you young men, help us quickly before you pray. Stack up more than three. That's not enough. 